Um, one of our traditions here is not to uh, give the uh, curriculum vitae of our speakers because uh, each one of them would occupy at least half of their presentation, so we just introduced them as doctor. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Hans Hasselbach, who does have a very long bibliography, like Dr. Schaefer and Verstavsik and others. And of course, I won't go through that. You can look them up on Google or their university sites. But Dr. Hans Hasselbach has for many years been uh, interested in the inflammatory aspects of the myeloproliferative diseases and the immunologic abnormalities that might be associated with them and has been a pioneer in the use of interferon and also the combination treatment with ruxolitinib, as you just heard. So, Hans, it's a pleasure to have you from Denmark. I hope you had a good flight, and please, uh, our audience is looking forward to your presentation. Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much to Dick for the nice presentation. Uh, I'm really deeply honored uh, and grateful to be here today with my MPN family. Uh, and uh, uh, just to, to, to emphasize that, that, that when I am here, it is due to Morten Holmstrom, my prior M uh, PhD student and now postdoc at the uh, National uh, Center for Cancer Immune Therapy. Morten has uh, opened the avenue for the journey that will be very exciting the years to come with, uh, in, with uh, 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 proving the concept of vaccination trials in, in patients with MPN. So just to tell you that Morten is in the red circle here. <laughs> what I want to tell you about today I want to tell you about the immune system and cancer immune therapy in general, cancer immune therapy in NPN, which designs are out there, what have we achieved of new knowledge in recent years to cover the knowledge gaps, status on the Danish vaccination projects, cancer immune therapy in NPN, ongoing studies elsewhere, and conclusions. But just let us ask the question, what is cancer immune therapy? To put it shortly, it is when we in enhance our defense cells, our immune cells against cancer. That is cancer immune therapy. The function of the immune system, we are every day exposed to a vari various microorganisms, but we cope with them because we have a very effective immune system. Then how does it all stick together, the concept, concept of immune su surveillance? In a healthy, he healthy cell produces healthy proteins. Parts of these proteins are degraded to what we call peptides. And these peptides, they are presented on the cell membrane. And as cytotoxic T cells, the killer cell, scans after this peptide on the surface, and then it, this, this uh, cell found non-healthy, non-self-peptides, no recognition of peptide, no T cell activation, and therefore the T cell continues its search after non-self-peptides. That is in the normal healthy person. It, immune surveillance makes the organism capable of, to recognize an inf infected cell. Here you have a virus invading a cell, Virus catches the cell's protein synthesis and the cell begins to produce viral proteins. And the viral proteins are degraded to peptides which are then presented on the cell surface. And then a specific virus-specific cytotoxic T cell recognizes the viral, the viral peptides and the cell, the infected cell is killed. But what then if the organism's own cells are protected, how are the cancer cells then recognized? The cell requires what we call a mutation. The cell may now be a cancer cell. The mutated gene elicits the production of a mutated protein, and the fragments of the mutated protein are presented on the cell surface. Then a T cell, the killer cell, then scans again the peptide, 
and the presented peptide is recognized as a non-self peptide, and then the T cell, the immune cell, activated immune cell kills the mutated cell, and the cancer cell dies. Which cancer immune therapies work or may work in patients with MPNs? We have the cytokine therapy, and as an example, I take interferon alpha-2. You know the reason why. And I take also bone marrow transplant, actually the most potent immune therapy we have. Immune check in point inhibitors and then cancer vaccines, both prophylactic and therapeutic. Let us look at the interferon alpha-2 advantages an old horse in the circus, 30 years experience, safety and efficacy, not a complicated or advanced therapy. It boosts our immune system, our immune cells. It does not suppress them as other chemotherapies do. Many patients have benefit of interferon therapy and minimal residual disease in a subset of patients after several years of therapy, about five years. And for sure, it is not leukemogenic or promoting tumors. Disadvantages, side effects, 20 to 40 percent is dropout, injections weekly or every second week. Then bone marrow transplant. Advantage, the only treatment with the potential of cure. Disadvantages, a long and very hard treatment. The patient may die during treatment, and some patients have serious side effects long term. And then I come to uh, the very complicated, the, the immune check inhibitors. And I will come back to them later. But just to tell you that they are easy to administer to patients. They are capable of cure otherwise incurable patients, for instance, skin cancer. And they have few side effects when we, uh, when we use the newer drugs. Disadvantages, extremely expensive. Not all patients have benefit of treatment and unknown efficacy in patients with MPN. What then about therapeutic vac cancer vac vaccination? Advantages, quite inexpensive and easy to produce. Few side effects. Disadvantages, not applicable in patients with advanced metastatic cancer. That is a very, very, very important point, and I will address this later. Not yet approved unknown efficacy in MPNs. What do we actually know about the immune system in patients with MPN? We know for sure that it is less effective than in healthy individuals. We also know that it's capable of recognizing the DAC2 mutation and the CALAR mutations. Immune cells from healthy individuals recognize the CALAR mutation. Very interesting observation. These immune cells are memory cells. They remember that they have previously met the CALAR mutation. And this is the evidence that the immune system of health individuals is able to kill CALAR mutated cells. Are we then able, by vaccination, to stimulate the immune system in patients to kill CALAR mutated cells? The immune system in patients with MPN is not functioning as well as in healthy individuals, as I addressed before. T cells, the killer cells in our immune system, are more exhausted, most in the advanced myelofibrosis stage. Increased amount of protein, call it breaks, that breaks the immune system, break pads. And very important, blood platelets adhere to T cells and break their function. Morton has shown that the immune system is able to recognize the DAC2 and CALAR mutations. The immune system in healthy individuals recognizes the CALAR mutations, just recently published in Blood, blood Cancer Journal. And then all these observations put us in the next setting, a clinical trial. And we have launched such a clinical trial uh, in Denmark, vaccination against the CALAR mutation, which is a highly immunogenic mutation. Being tested in patients with CALAR, vaccine with protein from CALAR mutation plus adjuvants, 15 vaccines in one year, it's a phase one trial, meaning that it's never been done before in humans. The primary objectives 
safety and side effects, secondary objective effects on the immune system, and tertiary objective clinical and immunological efficacy. Can we see the effect in blood cells? And Jacob Handler's Grauslund is our PhD student on this uh, uh, study. All patients are included, patients vaccinated between 10 and 15 times, side effects only a few, as with other vaccines, effects upon the immune system analysis is ongoing, and last vaccination of the last patient in February, March uh, ne next year. As you can see here, actually I can tell you that the clinical efficacy is non or modest. So conclusions, too early to draw final conclusions. Preliminary conclusions, and that is very important for our future research, that no serious side effects. The vaccine is safe. Modest, no clinical efficacy, and immune cell studies are pending. What about then vaccination against the DEX2 mutation? The vaccination, is, the vaccination protein is impossible to store in a clean condition, at least in our hands. It's not possible to vaccinate directly against the DEX2 mutation. Is vaccination against the DEX2 mutation entirely dropped then? No, no, it isn't. <laughs> Because the immune system has incorporated mechanisms and then try to imagine breaks which prohibit that it runs amok. These breaks are captured by the cancer cells, but the breaks can also be attacked by the immune system, and that is the important point. At least two of these breaks are increased in amount and in inhibit the immune system. The one break is an enzyme called arginase 1, and arginase 1 inhibits function of T cells, of our killer cells. And Wang et al. already in re leukemia research 2016 actually showed that arginase is increased uh, by gene expression profiling uh, and, and also increased uh, production from a subset of white blood cells called uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells. Arginase 1 inhibits function of our killer cells, our T cells. It is increased in MPNs, and T cells from MPN patients recognize arginase 1. And remember this break 2, called PDL1, is increased by inflammation and by the DEX2 mutation, and it makes T cells ineffective. T cells can kill PDL1 producing cells. Killing of PDL producing cells increases the function of the immune system. T cells from patients with MPN are able to recognize PDL1 just to repeat these very highly important messages. In a very nice study, uh, Prestepino and colleagues has, have shown that uh, the expression of PDL1 is increased in MPNs and it actually is mediated by the DAC2 mutation. Very, very important information. So, what have we of uh, immune escape mechanisms in MPN? Uh, mechanisms that make the soil not that good for patients. Increased levels of this subset of white blood cells called MDSC, but also the fact that increased levels of platelets, because platelets bind T cells and likely inhibit T cell activation. I cannot, uh, uh, I, I think that it should be put in perspectives that this novel information actually uh, uh, so, uh, uh, tells us that we shall not only watch and wait to see what happens. Increased levels of monocytes is also a very important issue because it increases transforming, uh, the protein transforming growth better beta and is potently uh, uh, immunosuppressive. 
So a lot of immune escape mechanisms that we have to cope with. Conclusions, both the DIAC2 and color mutations are chargeable by the immune system. Frequent and strong immune responses in healthy donors against color mutant epitopes. Color mutant peptide vaccine has weak or no effect and there are several immunosuppressive mechanisms in MPN. What are then the future perspectives? We might combine all our new findings, combine making a dual vaccine of arginase 1 and the PDL1, the, the break pads in MPNs, vaccination plus immune checkpoint blocking antibodies, and prophylactic cancer vaccination in patients with high risk of MPNs. This is our clinical vaccination trial against arginase 1 and PDL1 in patients with ETNPV just recently launched. The objective is to see if this vaccine will kill immune inhibiting cells uh, and if it's also killed JAK2 cells. So this is a, a cartoon of, of, of the program. We will vaccinate every second week with a total of six vaccines and then evaluation and eventually a new vaccination round, evaluation, etc. Other trials with cancer immune therapy in MPN, uh, I know that the uh, search at, uh, at uh, MD Anderson is uh, ongoing with these uh, antibodies and mascarensis at Mount Sinai or, as well. And my apology if I have not because it is ongoing in many places, actually. But my uh, apology, for, this is a very important study showing that if you add an immune check inhibitor, I have just told you that Calar vaccination alone is not effective, but if you add an immune check inhibitor, it might be very effective. And this is from the uh, Mascarenis and Ronald Hoffman's groups showing this very important study. T cells from patients with MPN have a high expression of breaks on the surface. Treatment with blocking antibody increases the immune response against the color mutation in the lab. So what are then the perspectives? Could we try to uh, uh, combine interferon alpha-2, the old horse in the circus, with vaccination? Here I will just repeat that it is of utmost important in my, my personal viewpoint to target uh, the stem cell at the earliest point time possible with interferon alpha. And we have shown that doing this, we will be able to induce minimal residual disease after five years of treatment with a normal bone marrow, minimal jak 2 allele burden, and even when you discontinue treatment, then st still after two to three years, the patient is in complete remission. And this is the first patient, and we have repeated it in several other patients. So we have to introduce a new concept in the MPNs, minimal residual disease. And this has to be defined by us in the future. Low tumor burden is mandatory for a successful outcome of therapeutic cancer vaccination. Improvement of tumor immune surveillance is mandatory from the time of diagnosis, in my personal viewpoint, with interferon alpha-2. This cartoon slow shows that patients with MPN have a defective tumor immune surveillance, and they have a block for interferon alpha. And the block is a downregulation of HLA genes on the cell surface. But when we then treat with interferon, then this blockage is uh, removed. The HLA genes are upregulated. And this is a wonderful situation because then you enhance tumor immune surveillance, the radar system, and then the killer cells can kill the tumor cells, the MPN cells. In the DALIA trial, we have now seen the first patients entering minimal, minimal residual disease. The, uh, the trial is closed and we are ongoing with the data analysis. And uh, uh, this also give us the impetus to the combination therapy with interferon alpha and the 2 inhibitor as Andrew just has mentioned briefly. And this is my lovely Pia, the first combi MPN patient being treated with 
can't be Ruxo plus interferon, and Pia is doing perfectly well today. With minimum, she actually has a virtual normal bone marrow and the actual little burden of around one percentage. And as I told you, our, our uh, studies uh, in cancer medicine are now in review in hematologic care with the same very promising results. And this has also been emphasized in a review paper in Leukemia 2016 that you have both to target the malignant clone with interferon alpha-2, stem cell targeted therapy, and the inflammatory drive on the clone. And you do this with Roxo, for instance, combi treatment. Let me just come back to the immunogenic mutations for a while. We, are our, we hope that we can achieve our goal by vaccination to eradicate the malignant clone in minimal residual disease and then cure the patient. And again, I emphasize that to vaccinate, you have to induce minimal residual disease with interferon alpha plus Roxo, for instance, because then we can move forward not to five years, but probably to three years. So again, to emphasize, low, burden, low tumor burden is mandatory for a successful outcome of therapeutic va cancer vaccination. This is not only for MPNs, this is normal knowledge. Vaccination in the chip phase, would this be a possibility in the chip phase? That is, we all, I may have the DIAC2 mutation. I may have the calar mutation, I don't know, but ho hopefully it will not hurt me. And this is called CHIP, that in the background population you may have these mutations. We have shown that MPNs are massively underdiagnosed cancers. In Denmark, 10,000 undiagnosed MPNs, equivalent to half a million in US. So we have simply to change our attitude and then set up screening studies in high-risk MPN profile patients. So let me come back to the chip towards over MPN. This is hypothesis driven that we may have patients with DAC2 allele burden of one percentage, but it does no harm to the, to, to the citizen and also the color mutation. But we may also have some which increase over time, and that is the interesting point, to dissect the factors that govern that some citizens that develop over MPN, is it chronic inflammation, for instance, or what is what is matter, or additional mutations, T2 mutation, which is also an inflammatory mutation. I like to say that we have two mutations in MPNs, inflammatory mutations. We have the DIAC2 mutation, giving rise to what is called reactive oxygen uh, radicals, but inflammation, and we have the TET2 mutation, which is also an inflammatory mutation. Now I will finalize by saying that even in the CHIP stage, you have an increased risk of thrombosis. We have shown this in blood, that if you have a very, very low burden of DIAC2, but no disease, even at that stage, you have an increased risk of thrombosis. And that gives so much impetus to, uh, uh, in my viewpoint, the new concept of early intervention in these diseases, not watch and wait. I will uh, give great credit to my colleagues in Denmark uh, at the National Center for Cancer Immune Therapy, and not least again uh, to Morten Holmstrom. Uh, try to see how he, with dedication and, and, uh, 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 and uh, also vision, uh, explains about his, his findings here to a lady on the right side. And this lady is not just a lady that jumped in. It is Crown Princess Mary of Denmark. So she just jumped in, said, what is going on here? And then Morten started to tell about the journey that we all look forward to be part of in the future. I wish you all a wonderful future, a bright future. Thanks so much. Hans, Hans thank you so much for that uh, stimulating talk.
Uh, most of us and patients think of vaccination as preventive. So you get a smallpox vaccination when you're young so you don't get smallpox or, or a diphtheria vaccination so you don't get diphtheria. But most of the patients have PV or ET or myelofibrosis clinically. Mm-hmm. They have overt disease. Why would you want to vaccinate them then? I've been asked that question, and I, I don't know how to answer it. So I said, Professor Hasselbach will be here, and could you answer that question for us? Uh, I, can tr- I can try, Dick. Uh, and uh, what I will say, I will underscore that, that uh, also in solid tumors, solid cancer tumors, you, it, it, it's a bad job to vaccinate in the advanced metastatic stage. It does not work. And it makes sense also in, 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 in actually we believe that when we have not that much su- success in our first CALA trial, uh, it was simply because we took in patients also with advanced disease. And th- therefore my, my, my answer to your, to, to your question is we have to perform vaccination trials. If you only vaccinate, then we shall do it in the early stage of the disease. Then we believe, we hope, and that, that is the reason why we now will enter patients from, the, from our chip population of 200. Will, uh, will, you, explain what, will you explain what chip is? Because uh, yeah, some I, will, of I will explain it. You and I, Dick, may have the DIAC2 mutation, but it... It would be fitting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but we are to, to, to just to tell people that that it does not hurt us, probably. But, but, and the reason for this, we do not know. God has decided so. But in some, the DIAC2 mutation increases over time, and we see this in our patient, in our citizens. It's not patients, it is citizens. And we follow them over time, half yearly. And we can actually see that some of them, they increase in the DIAC2 allele burden exactly 1.6 per year. We have shown this by mathematical modeling studies. So the DAC2 mutation will increase with 1.6 per year in some of the citizens. In others, it will not increase. So, uh, uh, and as I showed you, it is my hypothesis that when it increases, it is because you are a smoker, for instance. Inflammation, the most destructive you can do with yourself next to the atomic bomb, that is to, to, to smoke. A- and therefore, because smoking, smoking actually is a risk factor for MPNs. We have shown this in five studies now, also in large studies, that smoking is a risk factor for MPNs. This is actually not a surprise because smoking is also a risk factor for development of acute myeloid leukemia, and it is also a risk factor for development of the precursor stage of acute myeloid leukemia named myelodysplastic syndrome. But we have not made that reflection before in MPNs. Actually, it puts us in a, in a, in a situation where we have to to not only to tell the, the smoking, the smoker coming to our outpatient clinic with an elevated hematocrit because he or she smokes, with an elevated white blood cell count because he or she smokes, and 20% of smokers have an increased platelet count. I will not anymore say buy uh, some running shoes and stop uh, smoking. You actually have, and we do these studies now, you have to screen for the DIAC2 mutation in these. I know that, that it is a huge task, but we, if we shall have the opportunity to do the future better for these patients, we have to catch them at a much earlier time point than previously done, because we all know that before they come to us, they have one, two, three or four blood clots in the brain, in the lungs, in the heart. And if we, shall tra- if we shall change this, we have to change our whole attitude, our whole scientific approach, our clinical approach to the patients in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's uh, very provocative. Thank you so much.